We've always thought that our differences were in our genes, we're born the way we are. But new research suggests that other factors, such as any hardships children may face, might play a larger role than previously believed. Joining us now for more, Marla Sokolowski. She is co-director of the Child and Brain Development Program of CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And we welcome you here to TVO. Thank you. For your first television appearance ever? Yes. All right. Well, we're honored. That's good. Thank you. You did an article in New Scientist magazine that was called Scarred for Life, the Biology of Childhood Hardship. Let's just unpack that a bit, okay? How do you define childhood hardship? So childhood hardship will be a difficult thing to define, but if we start thinking about um, socioeconomic status to begin with, we find that there's a gradient in health according to socioeconomic status. And what that means is that whatever particular parameter you want to take, whether it's probability of getting cancer or heart disease or literacy or asthma um, or even social functioning, that individuals that come from adversity associated with low socioeconomic status, poverty, they have a much higher chance as children and throughout their life of having these, a higher risk for these diseases. And as you go higher up and have become more wealthy, that probability goes down. And it's surprising that this is a gradient, it's a, it's a slope rather than a threshold where one can say, okay, we all have enough food, we have shelter, and when you have all these things that are maybe what one would call the necessities for life, then you're gonna be okay. Most of the things on that list that you just gave, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say we've all been under the assumption that you get depending on who your parents are. Right. But you're telling us that ain't necessarily so. I would so. say 98% of um, diseases and disorders are to do with the way our genetic predispositions interact with our environment. Epigenetics. Um, that part of that is epigenetics and part of that is the genetic variation, our DNA sequence that we bring with us and then the environment that's out there and how in a sense our DNA is listening to the environment and responding to it. Is there, well I, I'm assuming that depending on how resilient you are as a child, right. all of those factors you just mentioned will have more or less impact right. on you as so a child. So that's what's particularly interesting is mm -hmm. when you think about individual differences, what makes us all different? Mm -hmm. And so even though I can say when you're from poverty or you um, have adversity, it's not only restricted to poverty, of course, that you have a higher chance, a higher risk, we're all different. And some individuals are more resilient or more buffered with respect to that early adversity, and some are not. And it's those individual differences that we're particularly interested in. And so my colleague Tom Boyce from UBC, who co-directs the Child and Brain Development Program, he with Bruce Ellis has described children as being orchids or dandelions. And so the dandelion kid is the kid that can grow between the cracks of the sidewalk. It doesn't matter where they're moved to, what's happening to them in their life, they always do pretty Very well. Very resilient. Resilient, exactly. Whereas the orchid child needs to be under the right temperature, the right humidity, and if that's the case, they'll flourish and they will surpass the orchid child, the dandelion child. Mm -hmm. However, if they're born into adversity and they're not nurtured, they will do really poorly. And so they think that our children have a tendency towards being orchids or dandelions. And, and it's not just pure, you're resilient or you're vulnerable, but it has to do with the environment you, you are born into and the sensitivity that you bring to that environment. Let me explore that a bit with you, because of course the great case study right. is Bill Clinton, yes. who, uh, you know, his father was dead before he was even born. Right. His stepfather abused his mother. He yeah. grew up in a violent home and the guy turns out <laughs> despite living in poverty, become president of the United States. Right. Uh, how is it that some children develop greater resiliency than yeah. others? So part of that is the developing it, and we can talk a little bit about that, but there's also genetic variations that are known for certain genes that will buffer you to those environments. So you, ha you, bring, you have those genetic variants, and if you come from a history of abuse, your performance, whether it's how, what, how you parent or your literacy or your emotional development will not be any different than a child that didn't come from that history of abuse. And so the, the genetics that you bring into it can help you. But also in terms of the environment you experience, it's, it's common that if 
all kids need in that environment is one individual, and it doesn't have to be a parent who's there for them. Someone they can talk to, someone who believes in them, someone who listens to their story. Teacher, preacher, whoever. A teacher, a whoever. preacher, a grandparent yeah. Yeah. who says, yes, I know this is happening. Yes, I know you were raped. I know it's not your fault. And you that know? can countermand. And that can really, really the help the situation. Huh. And so we want to somehow figure out which kids are super sensitive to the environment and how to help them um, manage these adversities, but also each kid deserves optimal development, right? Each kid deserves a chance to be the best that they can be. Mm. And so we want to provide early in life in terms of prenatal development and also postnatal development. Maybe before they reach school, we want to provide optimal environments for them. Sure. And we want to know what are those optimal environments. And so one of the questions is what environments actually matter? So if you get slapped around a few times by your parents, is that a bad thing for your later life health learning and functioning? I would say yes. Yes, no. or, but what about the slow drip of neglect and abuse mm. that's a slow, low level? And the, the data is showing that it's the slow drip of neglect and abuse that it can actually harm children more than a parent losing their temper a couple times, let's huh. say. And so we don't, know, we don't know what environments really matter scientifically to address this question, and we don't know over time what the characteristics of those environments are. We have lots of hints about it and lots of research, but we'd love to be able to say, okay, here are the things that matter, here are the kids that are sensitive, and this in type of interaction would really help them. I tossed out this term a few minutes ago, uh, assuming everybody knows what it means, but of course uh, that was a dumb assumption on my part. Epigenetics, yeah, okay. which we've talked about on this program a number of times, yeah. but I shouldn't assume everyone knows what no, it I'm means. I'm happy to explain Please, it. yes. So I would say there's two things we should explain. One is called gene by environment interactions, and the other is epigenetics. And so it used to be thought that, I'll just step back a tiny bit, that individual differences had to do with either nature or nurture in our genes or in our environment. And that idea is now dead. And the research that actually I did with fruit flies for many years really put that to rest. It's not one or the other. And you can't even add them together. You can't say 80% of what you're gonna be like is in your genes and 20% environment or the reverse. In fact, there's an interaction. So as I said, the DNA that we bring t with us, so a particular DNA in a gene, that can predispose us to be buffered or vulnerable to a certain environmental experience. And that um, gene-environment interaction takes into account the DNA sequence. That's not epigenetics. But if we look at identical twins, they come into the world with the same DNA sequence, that same blueprint. And yet, we know when those children grow up or you see them as adults, you can tell they're identical twins, but they're different, right? I mean, we're all in the habit of staring at them mm -hmm. and figuring out what's different. And their differences have to do with the environments that they've experienced. And we've known that too, but we now know that there's a biological mechanism whereby their experience gets embedded in their biology. It gets under their skin. And this mm -hmm. is what epigenetics is. And so what it is is the same DNA sequence it, just like identical twins, but the environment, for example, an environment of, of adversity, is somehow affecting how much these important genes for coping with stress are getting expressed. And if one thinks of the DNA sequence as a long hair, and it's all tight together and that makes a chromosome, those long hairs have proteins associated with them, and those, that long hair has to be available to the machinery in order to make the protein or the protein that that gene makes. Hmm. So what happens with epigenetics under stress is that DNA ends up wrapped around all these proteins and it's not accessible to make its enzyme, brain enzyme or protein or whatever. So the gene cannot be expressed. It's as though you have books in a library that are all packed up there. That's the DNA but we can't read them, right? Hmm. And so with epigenetics, it's like a dimmer switch. The environment is like a dimmer switch. It's turning up the gene expression or it's turning down the gene expression. And in the developing brain, which genes are expressed where and when is really important. So epigenetics affects our ability to read that book, which is the DNA, and make the proteins that are important for our biological functions. Well, let me read a comment from uh, the piece you did for New Scientist. Here's a quote. Suffering in our early years can have terrible after effects, and not only on us, but also on our descendants. We're now closing in 
on how the biology works. Uh, are you saying that epigenetics and the effects thereof are now handed down from generation to generation? So there's some evidence. I should say that epigenetics is in its early days, okay. that it's transgenerational, meaning it goes from generation to generation. And one of the ideas behind this is that when you experience adversity, we have a part of our body that helps us cope with stress. It, with stress. It's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Anyways, you probably know adrenaline and, and cortisol and some of the other hormones that are involved in stress responses. And so we have a, an ad adaptable way to cope with stress. But when you are growing up inside a mom and there's not enough nutrition or there might be abuse, that mother's environment is sing signaling to the embryo, you are going to be born into rough times. Mm. And that baby's axis gets, gets changed it, and so it has trouble coping with stress when that child's born. And it, to be adapted to that adverse environment, it's going to eat a lot. It's going to shift its attention as a child. It's going to have a suite of behaviors that are adaptive, given that the information it got in utero are saying you're going to be born into adversity. So I, I've now lost track of your question. No, then, but, uh, but then where, therefore the so the list of diseases or right, conditions right. that are eligible eligible is the wrong word right. that are uh, a potential factor right. in a kid. I mean, so I think you've listed some of them just now. So this stress affects um, our cardiovascular system, our okay. immune system, the way our brain gets developed, the hippocampus, mm. and, and you know our memory and our literacy, and so. It, if it has long-term effects. But the other thing, when you think about it, if I was growing in my mom, my eggs that are already going to make my daughter are already inside me, right? Your mother's grandchildren. Right. My mother's grandchild is there inside me. At least the egg is there. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's some thought that that is, in a way, how we have these transgenerational effects. It used to be thought that the egg and sperm were wiped clean from these epigenetic marks, but they're not so certain. But the other way that it can be transgenerational is how you're treated, right? And so if you, these rat pups, Michael and Meany's rat pups, the mums who lick and groom their rat mm. babies a lot, those babies become high licking and grooming mums and their um, uh, stress axis is healthy. But the mum rats that lick and groom their pups a little bit, those babies have trouble coping with stress. And if you cross foster them, you give a, a low licking and grooming pup to a high licking and grooming mom, that pup becomes a high licking and grooming mom. It's <laughs> nothing to do with her genetics, it's how she was treated. And so there could also be this transgenerational effect according to how you were treated and the, and the behavior. So we don't quite understand how this transgenerational epigenetics works at the mechanistic biological level, but there's more and more evidence um, involved supporting it. One of the things we learned from your piece is that Canada, despite being a rich Western country, isn't doing as well as people think uh, we're probably doing when it comes to childhood well-being. And we, I'm looking at the numbers here, we got a one out of 10 on the targets of the UN's Convention on the Rights of the Child. We got one out of 10 targets. And UNICEF, puts us 21st out of 29 rich countries in terms of relative childhood poverty rates. What do you think the consequences are of our failing to improve on those numbers? I think there's huge economic consequences in terms of health, in terms of um, being able to generate children who will become adults who can function well socially in terms of mental health in our society, who can enter the workforce in, you know, in an educated way with, with good skills. And, it also, I think, personally has an effect on our ability to live in a pluralistic society. And so being able to live with people in a welcoming way of different races and different religions. And we, we seem to be doing pretty well at that, we are though. Do, we are doing well. But what we don't have are preschools, very high quality daycare centers for children. Unlike mm -hmm. Quebec does a better job in this. We don't have community centers for parents to come and bring their babies and their kids, for parents to talk to each other and to get advice. Hmm. And it's particularly the kids at the low, in the poverty end, that really, really benefit from, from day, daycare. And yet, in spite of what you've just told us, we are at the forefront of research on the harmful effects on childhood biology of all of right. what we've been we talking about. We are at the forefront. And so how do you explain just, that? Well, I think it's a new science, first of all. And uh, we just, I was just involved in an expert panel report from the Royal Society of Canada 
talking about the state of children in Canada and with a bunch of recommendations. And this, our CIFAR group has put out uh, a number of, of reports and um, Sackler Symposia, et cetera. So we're just becoming aware of, of this idea that the early experience matters for later life. And I think in the past, people didn't think about children like that. I mean, the extreme cases, people not even talking to their kids until the kids started to talk, right? Hmm. But we know that children are listening in utero, in utero three months before they're born. They can distinguish between French and English, for instance, the sounds of French and English. We know their brains um, are going through critical or sensitive periods for language, for, for smell, for touch, Classical even before they're born. Classical versus rock and roll, even. Absolutely, jazz, and, yeah. and, and you can yeah. measure all these things. So there's a lot that we, we didn't imagine going on in these very young brains. You taught, I mean, this sounds like a setup for a Letterman joke, but you did tell us about fruit flies having, yeah, yeah. that you studied having an impact yeah. on all of this area of research. Yes. How is that possible? So the work that um, I've done over the years has found a single gene called foraging that makes some flies move a lot, they're initiators from a personality perspective, and others assess the situation. They sit around and assess. And this gene interacts with the environment. It interacts with your early experience, your nutritional experience. So that if you grow up in poverty as a fly versus not poverty, when you emerge and you explore your environment, you explore it quite differently. You take different risks. You have different exploratory behavior. If you grow up in adverse, nutritional adversity, you become very fat. And your foraging, food search behavior differs, your learning and memory differs. So even though it's a fruit fly, this gene that, that we discovered is found in all other organisms, including humans. And we can understand how it works. We can even do gene therapy in a fly. And so we can take that gene and put it in later and ask, does it, does it fix these, these problems of do, early environment? How do you catch a fruit fly to study what a fruit fly can represent? So we have millions of flies in my lab. <laughs> I mean, we, okay. we give tours, and um, they can be studied in all kinds of fabulous ways. I mean, you can put them in tubes, stick the head out and a leg out, and, and ask the fly, are you hungry? And you put a little bit of sucrose on their leg, and they stick out their tongue, basically saying, feed me. <laughs> and so you can ask them questions. You can see if they learn and remember if you have two flies fighting, a young fly will watch. And when you pair that young fly with the winner, the young fly will act like a wimp. And if you pair that young fly with the, the loser of the fight, he'll act like a big shot. So they even have social cognition. They even learn from, from their peers. Fruit flies. Fruit flies, yes. Extraordinary. And, and we can find the molecules in the brain. We can change the levels of them. Um, we can understand from birth what neurons gave rise to those molecules, how the environment affects whether it's going to be a neuron or a glia, what the brain connections might be. Hmm. So it's way simpler than mice or humans, but in a way there's a lot of advantages. Marla, I got about a minute left here. <laughs> okay. a, lot of, a lot of advantages. I'm moving right on from that one. What's uh, next for you in terms of your research? So we have two pronged research. Um, one is with mammals and it's with uh, looking at how genes in the environment interact uh, in humans as well in terms of uh, early adversities and how they affect parenting and um, feeding and things like that. And then with the fruit fly work, we want to understand more about epigenetics and how it interacts with the DNA sequence with allelic variation. So people bring predispositions into life and how does the environment act on them and at the biological end, how is this affecting brain development and function? Poof. Another day at the beach. <laughs> I, love, uh, I love it, so it's a good beach. Pretty heavy stuff. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing Pleasure. your information about this today. Marla Sokolowski from the U of T and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.